There are three tools that we recommend, and the first is to normalize it. And having this conversation is one way of doing that. So just bringing it to people's attention and saying, <laughs> you're not the only one. <laughs> we there are Many of us have right. this issue. Um, what someone can do for themselves is to reframe it. And that is the second tool that we recommend. And one of the one of the ways to reframe it is to understand, you know, like the the biggest number, the the most common number used is seventy percent of people experience this. Or in in your world, you know, eighty five or ninety percent experience this. So I'm not alone. Um, but what we do is we look at well, what's the difference between someone who feels like an imposter and someone who doesn't? And so because this is part of the reframe, because. What is it about these other, let's just say, what do you think it is in construction? You think it's 80% of your clients experience imposter syndrome? 95. 95, yeah, okay. 90, and really 100, but I, there's probably an outlier out there that's not. All right. Well, let's let's just leave some room open that there are people out there who yeah. truly don't feel like an imposter. And some of those people are suffering from something that um, is even worse than imposter syndrome. It's what we call irrational self-confidence syndrome. This is kind of your Dunning-Kruger effect, you know, smartest guy in the room. They might really suck, but they still, they're like, I'm the but, best. But um, and they believe it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, okay, we're just gonna set them aside because nobody really wants to be that person. But there are people who, um, who are genuinely humble, but have never felt like an imposter. And the reason we need to understand this group is because um, is because there's only one difference between the people who are humble but have never felt like imposters and those of us who don't. They are no more talented or intelligent or capable or qualified than you or me. Um, the only difference between them and us is that in the exact same situation where we might feel like an imposter, they're thinking different thoughts. That's it. Um, so all we have to do is learn to think like them. Mm. And they have a different relationship with, uh, they, have a, they have a different understanding, a more realistic understanding of what it means to be competent. We just talked about those five imposter types. Those are all kind of distorted definitions of what it means to be competent. So a humble realist is what Valerie calls it. Um, has this different definition of what it means to be competent. They think and respond differently to failure and mistakes and constructive criticism. And they think and respond differently to fear because we're, you know, there's, there's a, a fear, right? So, so reframing what competence really means. So understanding that you know, wow, if I could just think a little differently about my situation, about what I think competence is, about when a customer complains about something, if I can just kind of reframe that, then that is going to, that's a, a very important step that an individual can take on their own. Yeah. You know, I'm really glad we left a percentage there because somebody just came to mind, a client of mine who is not an imposter. Mm -hmm. Khalil, he's going to be a guest on our show here in the next number of weeks. <laughs> yeah. I thought, oh, yeah. He may be, but it's not evident, and I worked with him a long time. Yeah. So, okay. So it's not everybody. I think. But it's most. I, I think for myself, you know, as far as thinking different thoughts, I like that you said that. And it reminds me that for, like, if I'm in a healthy space, it's usually because I've took some time to journal. Um, I, I really enjoy journaling. Uh, when I get really busy, I don't. But if I take time to journal for 15, 20 minutes, it can really change the way that I see the day, the world, my tasks, all that kind of stuff. And it almost reminds me a little bit, um, if you've ever read the Psalms from the Bible, um, sometimes David would like start a Psalm and he's, the world is going to end and I'm the worst person in the world and God has banished me and he doesn't care about me. And by the end of the Psalm, he's like, oh, he's so good. Life is great. Like, I'm so thankful. Like, praise the Lord. And uh, it just reminds me, like, that's basically what happens when I journal. It starts with just like, man, the world is awful. I suck. I, I did this wrong. I did this bad. Uh, this person hates me, whatever it is. But by the end, I'm like, oh, okay, like, here's a path forward, and it's going to be okay. Um, yeah. And I think that's probably the biggest thing is 
if you, for myself, if I don't get some of those bad thoughts out, that thinking that is, you know, self-deprecating and that the imposter syndrome thoughts, if I don't get those out, then they just kind of marinate in my head and they just stew around and uh, continue to bog me down. But if I can get them out, whether it's talking to somebody or primarily for myself journaling, because I don't really enjoy sharing a lot, although I'm sharing a lot right now. Um, <laughs> I I think that when I do journal them, it really does help me to move past them uh, and to see them at yeah. face value as well. Yeah. And being a superhuman, you know, as you journal and think about reframing a situation, you know, a humble realist is going to understand that, you know, nobody excels at everything mm-hmm. all the time. And and especially not at the same time. So, you know, just I know you're a soccer guy, but if we can use baseball as an analogy, yeah. you know, you can't expect yourself to be the star pitcher, star catcher, star hitter and star outfielder all at once. It's just not possible. So, you know, as you're journaling and thinking about, for, you know, for anyone who ad- identifies as a superhuman, you might one day you rock it at work but you might not on the soccer field. One day you rock it on the soccer field, but you suck as a parent yeah. because your kid's mad at you, like whatever it is. And so it's just, you could still have high standards, but just give your yourself, perso- uh, you know, permission to be a mere mortal like the rest, like the rest of us. I feel really well, found out right now. I feel like you've just like diagnosed my entire <laughs> life of superhuman. Khalil, I've, I've known, as long as I've known you, that you're a mess. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it, it, no. <laughs> Well, you know, yeah, journaling is tell, a great idea. I can I, tell that exactly describes you, Khalil. What <laughs> yeah, a mess. Yeah, every, right. everybody knows Khalil's a mess. <laughs> Hardly. Everybody knows that. It's common knowledge. Yeah. 